Hi, I'm James Riley. And I'm Bob Powers. And we're from the Goliath Historical Fencing Academy. And we're here today to finish our three-part uh, series on the five words, something that we started, I think, uh, four, four years ago at this point. A long time. <laughs> so uh, we've had a pandemic, and we've basically had a whole post-pandemic at this point. And, uh, and I think it's time that we, we, we wrap this up. So, quick recap on what we did in the first in the first video. So the um, the first two videos. The first thing that we talked about was what strong is. So you can go back to the video to see. But basically, the idea is that I'm organizing my structure, my chest, my hands, my hilt, and my point all in one singular line. So I can draw a straight line through all of those, and then I'm going to orient it in the direction of their sword. We call that strong on the sword. We call that being strong. Um, we call that in the strong, we call that uh, when we say that someone is strengthening or hard, all of that is meant to get us into this position, such that all of the components of our sword are in line with our opponent's sword, right? And then alternatively, we say that the weak is not that. Anything that's not that, anything that's oriented in a different direction fundamentally, uh, either accidentally or otherwise, is going to be weak, so we call that weak. So in this case right now, I'm strong on my opponent's sword, uh, if, if, if Bob took his sword and put it behind his back, I would be strong on my opponent's sword, right? Nothing, nothing about this changes, nothing about my behavior should change, right? Uh, and so the fundamental insight from this position of strength is that if I chose to move, if I was in this position of strength and I chose to move first, um, I could move first in such a way where I could go from my taker, right, this position of strength, directly to a hitter, right? And Regardless of what my opponent does, I will be able to either hit him or not hit him, but safely, right? So in this case, I could extend my short, and if my opponent tried to counter offensive action in this moment, then I would deflect his sword as I'm moving through my strong position to uh, my new position, which is gonna be strong on the man. Weak on the sword, but strong on the man. Uh, but I'm going to have mitigated his counter offensive action throughout that entire exchange. Alternatively, if I begin in a strong position and my opponent uh, tries to defend the action, right? so not a counter-offensive action, but, but an actual defensive action, I can begin my offensive action, he can defend, and he gives me a moment that I can relax my structure and work weak, fr work, uh, weak from the old position into a new position, right? And so I can hit in the instance of motion that I create with the threat of my strong position, right? So I can work in this, and that's what we covered in the second video, right? So both of these cases, I can go directly to my hitter, and I can either work in this or hit, depending on how my opponent attempts to respond to that. Alternatively, if I have my strong position, I can safely work from the knock. If my opponent tries to uh, perform his own offensive action, right, regardless of what it is, I can immediately hit in that moment, right? So I can, uh, if he pulls a sword above his head, I can hit, or if he goes to a high bind, then I can chase the hand, or uh, if he attempts to do clearing underneath my sword, I can strike in that moment and keep his sword behind mine the entire action, right? So the benefit of being strong in the bind is that I can work both safely from the vor and from the knot. What we're going to talk about today in these videos are what the vor and the knot are. Right? So specifically, what's happening in the vor and the knot. And then we're going to take our metaphysical framework of the five words, and we're going to see if we can derive or project a, um, a tactical framework that we can then apply to all of our exchanges that will guide us with milestones of, of, um, uh, of action and consequence so that we're always behaving in the, in the optimal way, in the best way, right? So, okay, so what does the vor mean? Well, let's talk about what it could mean. One of the ideas about what the vor is, is that it's initiative, right? So uh, we can say, uh, I, I can, I can, clearly illustrate an idea of initiative just by, if my opponent's standing in a bump tag with a sword on his shoulder, I can, I can take the initiative in this moment by offering the initial threat. Right? So, and my opponent can respond working in the knock, 
and then we can fence from there, right? Uh, and so we can say before means the person who does that, right? Uh, but then there's a problem with the idea of initiative, right? So in this case, the initiative that I took was I'm going to compel this motion across the center line from my opponent, and then presumably I'll work in Des his ch his taker um, to chase to a new opening and then use that to hit, and that's why I would want initiative. But if initiative is purely compelling motion on the part of my opponent, then I can do that without doing anything at all, right? So, for instance, if my opponent's standing there and his sword is in presence, right? So his sword's, uh, he's a long point, point towards me, and I just stand here like this, right? What I'm essentially doing is I'm inviting my opponent to strike at me, right? And if initiative is the way that we're gonna think about the boar, then there's a sense in which I'm seizing the initiative in this moment by provoking my opponent to behave in a way that's predictable and reliably predictable with reliably predictable consequences, right? Uh, that I could take advantage of. So if I'm here and I say, oh, come, please, no, don't strike me in the face, and he does, then I'm able to respond, I'm able to parry and repost because my opponent was essentially behind even as I wasn't doing anything. And the question is, are we going to regard the vor as something that can be expressed that way? And um, our sense is that, is that that's not what we're going to do. Right? Alternatively, there's a question of threat. So like the first person to offer a credible threat. So the vor is a, is a person who is, is, is uh, attacking first or is threatening a, a threatening uh, a, a legitimate form of attack, right? Something that could potentially come to completion and end in a touch. And I take a bit of issue with that as well. And one of the reasons is because if we begin, let's say, let's say we, we begin in uh, Bob is strong on my sword. So Bob is controlling the space my sword is occupying. All of you can see this beautiful structure here, point, hands, chest, all in line in the direction of my sword. And by the way, with frequency modus, he can maintain his position of strength, just following my sword regardless of where it goes, right? So all of this, in all of these instances, he's actually not changed anything qualitatively about the structure of the spot, just for the record. We'll, we'll get uh, to that later. But the bottom line is, if I'm here in this moment, and I begin an offensive action, we'll say, I'm beginning an offensive action by targeting his weakness, which is the side of his body that he's not strong, right? The side of the center line that he's not strong. I will be targeting this side, right? Well, so the problem with threat, from my perspective, is if I begin this action, I could potentially hit him, but if he works in as my weakening, the invariable weakening that I'll have to have in order to to threaten him, so I'm gonna dirt in this case. If he works in as my weakening, he can actually hit simultaneously, right? He can close the line and strike me. Go ahead, finish. Yeah, he can strike me in that instance of motion. And so if we're thinking threat, and threat is gonna be defined as sort of a clear path to my target, a clear path to his body, a clear path meaning his sword is not in the middle of it. Well, then we say all of this action on my part, right, and it could be the same on this side, all of this action on my part is behind his sword, right? And so there's a sense here in which my opponent has the vor, or is in the vor, if we're going to think of the vor as being threatened, because he's threatening me the entire time, even throughout the course of my weak action. I was attempting an offensive action. I was attempting a hitter. I was the one moving first. And yet I was never a threat to him. And he initiated his action within my action. So not before, within. So both the cases of initiative and threat are less relevant to the way that we are thinking about the vor and the knock in this school. So the way that I want to think about the vor and the knock in the school is the first person who performs an action, whether it be by the blade or, or otherwise, we'll get to otherwise here in a little bit, 
but the first person to create the action that results in a qualitative change of the nature of the bind, right? And the nature of the bind, meaning the strong and weak relationship of our sort. So if we begin, I'm in a strong bind. My opponent is weak in the bind, and he attempts an offensive action, right? Whatever the offensive action is, he begins his offensive action. And then in that offensive action, he's weak, he's continuing to weaken, and then he's in the vor. And I am responding in des and hitting my opponent. I'm working from the knock, but really I'm working, I'm working in des from the knock. And because I'm working in des from the knock, I'm retaking the vor. What the vor is, is the, 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 the person who is initiating the qualitative change in the nature of the body. So in this case, my opponent, even as he's never threatening me the entire time, maybe he's looking this time, he's never threatening me the entire time, he performs a weak action in the vor, and yet I can work in this to hit. Right? Uh, and then there's a sense in which I've retaken the vor. If my opponent, uh, if my opponent instead uh, performs an action from the vor just by striking into this, and so maybe he goes up to bomb top, and I'm standing here in a weak posture, right now the, the nature of, of the bind is that we're both weak, and my opponent can enter into distance and strengthen and hit in this moment. Go ahead. And he can hit me. He's, this has resulted in a qualitative change in the nature of the vine. So right now, he is, he is now strong, and I am now weak. He's covering the direction of my sword. Uh, he's hitting me in this instance. He's taking the vor in this case, right? So it's the person who moves first. In as much as it relates to a change in the nature of the vine. And this is what, this is where it gets a little bit tricky, and this is why we're going to talk about otherwise and distance, how distance relates to vor and knock. There's a distance at which, regardless of what my opponent's actions are, they're irrelevant to the nature of the bind. Let's talk about why the nature of the bind is the way it is. Uh, bring your sword to bear. So if I'm strong on my opponent's sword, and uh, my opponent performs some kind of, uh, do a, a dirt specs on my opponent performs some kind of, <laughs> if my opponent performs some kind of dirt specs on, I'm able to work within my opponent's dirt specs on, and I'm able to hit my opponent in this, yeah? The reason that I can do that is because the, the, the length of time that it takes uh, Bob to bring his dirt specs on to completion is longer than the length of time it takes for me to cover his new line and or cover the, uh, his new uh, angle of attack in a strong way and hit simultaneously. So my hitter comes to completion before his hitter or his taker if he starts from a weak position and I start from a strong position. The other side of that is if I begin a strong action and uh, or if I begin from a strong position and I begin a hitter, my opponent can parry and my chaser will come to completion before his counter-offensive action. So if I'm here and I begin my thrust and he carries, if he tries to perform a counter-offensive action, I'm going to hit before he's able to get his counter-offensive action off. So the, the, the nature of the five words is that from a strong position, actions are shorter across the space of time. They come to completion before the corresponding action from a weak position. And here's why distance is relevant to that. Right? If, I, if I begin here in, in what we'll call the Sufeshtim, and I try and take my opponent's sword, it's very hard for me to take my opponent's sword. He denies me, uh, he des he denies me to take him. Let's say I start by having taken, so I find myself here, and I begin some sort of offensive action, right? If he parries, and I go to chase from here, he has all the time in the world, because the, the length of time for him to parry was so short that he, it he was actually able to get it to completion fast enough so that he, begin, he could begin his new defensive action 
corresponding to my chaser and leaving him in a strong position. So <clears throat> there's a distance at which me having a strong position doesn't necessarily afford me a shorter time to the completion of my actions than my opponent. And really the distance, the relevant distance between what we'll call the Sufeshtim and the Krieg is going to be that demarcation. Am I close enough where my strong position will guarantee me safe entries either from the boar or from the knight? Right? And the answer is, or, or, or rather, the idea that we can sort of develop out of that is that any action that I do outside of this distance, right? If I'm here and I'm behaving, none of this is for actions. None of what I'm doing here is affecting the nature of the bind because none of it is relevant to whether or not my action will come to completion before my opponent's action. He always has enough time to get strong when that distance happens. So, so the idea is, how do we move from the far distance, what we call the sufeshtin, where the strength or weakness of the bind is irrelevant to the exchange, to a distance where it's very relevant to the exchange, in a way that's advantageous to us. And I can do that from both the vor and the knot, right? Remember, the person who's in the boar is the, is the person who is creating the first instance of change, or the, the first instance of motion, qualitative motion, not necessarily local motion, but qualitative motion. Um, the first instance of change in qualitative motion of the strength of the bind, right? And I can do that by maybe entering in such a way where I threaten a strong position. Uh, go to so I'm here, and I am in the suggestion, nothing is going to matter. So yeah, my opponent, he got a little antsy there, but you notice he stopped. He said, oh, I'm, I don't need to defend this because he hasn't broken that distance, right? But if I do come in, and he does, he immediately recognizes that he needs to become strong. Right? So my game is, how can I create an instance of motion, right, where I can now use my principles of, uh, of strong and weak and indes, uh, to create an advantage for myself and then eventually score ahead. So I can do that just by threatening a strong position. And if my opponent attempts to take in that motion, then I can immediately move into my chase. Never having achieved a strong position because I'm operating in the instance of motion that I've created in my training partner. Okay, so I can do that with a four action that threatens a position of strength, compelling motion on the part of my opponent, right? And if no motion, if I, if I get no motion on the part of my opponent, then all I've done is move from a weak position to a strong position that's relevant, and now I move right to my hitter, and it doesn't matter what he does. All right, so I'm here, uh, and my opponent does nothing. I move, I've created a, an instance of change in the, in the qualitative relationship of the body. I'm now strong in measure. I am in the vor in this case. And now if he continues to do nothing, I continue in the vor the entire time. Right? If he, if, if instead my opponent responds, I, I successfully compel motion in my initial uh, action, right? Then I can begin chasing my opponent and he can continue to parry as much as he wants and eventually I'm going to keep overrunning him with my, with the strength that I've gained, the strength of advantage that I've gained, and eventually hit with one of my chasers. So maybe I strike in and he parries and I go, and I hit you. Yeah. Right? Whatever the case may be. So that's how I can do, that's how I can compel that change in a way that is that starts in the board, right? I can threaten a strong position, or I can compel an instance of motion on the part of my opponent. But another way that I can create that change is simply by uh, uh, inviting my opponent to enter distance in a weak way. So We'll talk real quick about the idea that all hitters are weak. Right? So if we think about what does it mean to be strong on the sword, so if you bring your sword here one more time. So strong on the sword means that I am maintaining this structure, point, hilt, 
hands, chest, all oriented in the direction of my opponent's sword. And regardless of where my opponent moves the sword, regardless of where he moves the sword, I maintain that structure. And if he goes slow, I go slow. And the reason is because I'm working using Fuelin to work in Des so that our actions are happening at the same rate across space. But my actions are coming to completion at a faster rate across time because they are shorter, because I've gained inside position. So we're, we're gonna say that all of that motion hasn't actually resulted in a, in, a, in a structural change of the bind. All of that instance of motion has left us with the exact same bind, this strong weak relationship that we've had the entire time. The moment the change happens is when I move from the instance where I'm strong on my opponent's sword, or uh, don't, don't move your sword, so, to where I'm strong on the man. So now all of a sudden, I'm reorienting my structure away from the sword to the man. And you say, well, you shouldn't do that if you're weak. Well, it's okay to do that if I'm weak if I started in a strong position, because that guarantees that he has to do a defensive action to mitigate it. I'm not looking to ensure that I land my hitter. I'm looking sure that any defense that he has isn't going to hit me in response. Now, if I do that from a weak, uh, weak position, then I'm, I could potentially, uh, you could take or just hit in that, right? So, boom, I could just get hit, right? So, the idea is, I want to begin, this is a weak hitter, the same as, this is a weak hitter, uh, but the difference is, uh, because I'm starting from a strong position, I can do this safely, whereas if I'm starting from a weak position, I can do it, but not safely, all right? And then the last thing there is, well, what if we reach this magic space where, uh, maybe in like this kind of bullshit now. So what if we're in this magic space where I can be strong on the man and strong on my opponent's sword simultaneously, all right? And what I'm gonna suggest is, this is still fundamentally weak because I no longer have frequency modus. Okay? So frequency modus is the idea that I can maintain the qualitative relationship of the bind through instances of motion so that even as there is a local change from his sword moves from one position to another, there's no qualitative change. I'm still strong the entire time. So frequency modus is the idea that I'm tethered to my opponent's sword and I follow it regardless of where it is. As soon as I reorient my focus to the man, I'm no longer tethered on the sword. I'm now tethered on the man. And so there's nothing that I can do to keep him from pushing my sword out of the way. That being said, through the establishment of my initial strong relationship, I've ensured that there's no way that he can move my sword out of the way in a way that leaves me vulnerable to his hitter. And so no matter what he does in this motion, in this, in this instance, yeah, I can work in as the subsequent action, right? Because it's gonna leave me safe the entire time. So the vor is the person who's, through the movement of their blade, creates a qualitative change in the nature of the bind in the strong and weak relationship of the blades. And the person <clears throat> who does so at a distance where it's relevant. And the game is, how do I move from the distance at which that bind is re isn't relevant to the distance at which the bind is relevant in a way that leaves me either in a strong position or leaves me with an instance of motion on his part. Right? So, I'm gonna use my provoker taker hitter model, right? So the first model I can use with provoker taker hitter is the idea that I create instance, an instance of motion on his part or nothing through my initial vor action threatening a strong position. So if he does nothing, I can immediately move to my hitter because I've, I've, I've strengthened my position. I'm strong <coughs> across the center line. So in the direction of his sword, I'm strong. I can move right to my hitter. Or if he does something to mitigate this action, I can immediately follow up with the chaser. So I can cross from the succession into the creek in a way that leaves me strong or in an instance of his uh, defensive motion. 
The other way that I can do it is I can do it by deceiving the distance, by compelling my opponent to target me. All hitters are weak. And so if I can trick my opponent into thinking that he should, that he should attempt to hit me, but trick him into believing that he's within the distance where he can actually hit me before I get my defensive action off, then what I can end up doing is taking in that moment and working from my newly gained offensive position or newly gained strong position, right? And so the game is create an instance of motion using my four actions, using my initial change in the in the uh, um, nature of the vine, moving from, in this case, a weak position to a strong position, or a strong position into a strong position, um, watching him respond somehow and working in as that response, using frequency modus to maintain that strong position until I'm within range to hit, and then beginning my knock rising or my chasing. Or another way that I can do it is I can deceive the distance, tricking my opponent into believing that he's in the creek and forcing him to attempt a weak action that will eventually, uh, <clears throat> or that you know he believes is going to result in a hitter. So he, he strikes his weak action, but because it was a hitter, it was an attempt at a hitter, I'm able to take a strong position. And then from here, I can begin my offensive series of actions, either from my strong position or in as his defensive actions in response to mine. So that's all we got for today. Thank you so much, guys, and uh, we're glad that we could finally finish this video series. Bye.